listeners, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Double L. <laughs> Double L. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, I was trying to think of new nicknames for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Double L. I have not, that is a new one for sure. <laughs> it could be shortened all the way to Dub L. Dub L. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> But oh. we'll probably not use that. Um, yeah, it only took a week, apparently, for me to forget the intro. Yeah, this, you this flubbed was, it. <laughs> this was take two. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely a flub. Yeah, well, I don't have any excuse. Yeah, um, what you going to do? But I, I hope you guys enjoyed your week off yeah. <laughs> from having to listen to us. Oh. And But we're back, back for more. Absolutely. Yeah. After, yeah, yeah long, long week. Yeah. I guess. And uh, this is going to be different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I have not had time to read. Yeah. Not much anyway. Like, yeah. Not enough. Yeah. Not enough that you feel good enough about doing the podcast about what you read. Yeah. I mean, I can talk about some things. But, <laughs> um, you know, there's there's war and pestilence and yeah. all, all kinds of terrible things to talk about. Um, but I thought that instead that we would talk about uh, terrible media, and I don't even mean like the you know mainstream media in terms of news and stuff. I mean, like yeah. you, know, you, you mean movies not the, and oh, TV yeah. shows and yeah. like the, the other propaganda. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and you know, I don't know if we'll see if people find this interesting, but it, it's it's getting to me, and um, and I think. Like, all right. So here's my uh, here's my premise. Like, this is the this is my my postulate. All right, is that the um, the uh, feminist and Me Too movements have destroyed storytelling in Hollywood. Yeah, that's what I'm. Okay, so um, yeah, we had my uh, my birthday dinner last night, and it consisted of me and my mom and my mom's caregiver. And so I got to reflect on that through my you know forty some years of life. I have connected with so few people and managed to offend, lose track of, or alienate so many of them that I had literally no friends at my birthday. <laughs> wow. So I'm going all in. Yeah. I figured just go ahead and try and... and, and <laughs> offend yeah. all of our listeners as yeah, well. Yeah, just keep pushing this. <laughs> May as well. What, what's there to lose? Um, but what sparked this mostly uh, was just a couple of things that I've, I've seen recently. Um, the big one is uh, Rings of Power on... I heard it's horrible. ...on Amazon Prime. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think it's not been reviewed particularly well. I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. I mean, there were more um, high-star reviews than low-star reviews on Amazon, um, but I also came across uh, something that suggested that Amazon deleted, like, several <laughs> thousand one-star reviews. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, um, they own the platform, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of like um, a pharmaceutical companies doing their own research on effectiveness, and that's being yeah. what's used to it, promote it, it by the government. Exactly. Um, so I was actually irritated enough by the end of the series because I was really looking forward to this. Like, I'm yeah. a fan of the source material. Yeah. Um, I read uh, Hobbit. Uh, I, I didn't even read... I didn't even start reading these things until I was in my late twenties. Yeah. So I missed them when I was young, I guess when most, when most guys get into it in their teens or yeah. whatever. But I, um, I read Hobbit when I was like, I don't know, 27, 28, uh, a roommate gave it to me and he was like, no, you got to read that. Or didn't give it to me, lent it to me. Yeah. Um, and then I read the Lord of the Rings series, you know, a couple of years later. And then, just maybe five or so years ago, I read the Silmarillion and yeah, I really enjoyed all the stuff. I think Tolkien is a, um, is a hell of a good storyteller. Yeah. It's an interesting world he's created. Yeah. And it's, it's impressive. Um, <clears throat> now he's using like a lot of real world stuff as a base, but, um, there's, I, I think that there's few authors that I have come across that, that have effectively, effectively being the key word here, yeah. um, effectively created, um, fantasy worlds that feel that don't feel contrived, that yeah. feel like they existed before the events of the story, uh, that have their own histories and, um, cultures and, um, 
and interactions that predate the story that's told. Yeah. And it doesn't feel forced. Yeah. And so Tolkien's one of them. Uh, another one that I like is Frank Herbert. I, the Dune series felt that way too. Oh yeah. Uh, so you've completely created this world out of nothing, but somehow you've created this world out of nothing that doesn't feel like it's, it's isolated. Yeah. That feels like it's connected to events before and, 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 a um, and is going to continue beyond. The guys are really into Dean, like the, you know, Justin Spencer, oh, yeah. all of those guys. Yeah, no, they're huge fans of Dean. So I've heard a lot about Dean, but I haven't read the books or anything. So well, I've got them. If I, you want, they're, it, they're, it, honestly, it sounds like an undertaking. I don't it, know if it it's something that yeah. I've, I'm willing to get on to. It's but, definitely but, an undertaking. It's probably it's, four thousand pages of material or something yeah, like that. But they love it. Like yeah. I mean, they're long conversations mm-hmm. about the goings on in those stories. Yeah, well, there's there's real interesting aspects of that one, um, particularly that I liked uh, having studied anthropology. Yeah, uh, where the culture, um, the cultures fit the environments. Yeah, and it, again, it doesn't feel like something that was forced. It feels it feels very natural, and that's that's hard to do. I think. Yeah. Um, I, you know. I did some short stories and stuff when I was younger, but I, I never tried to do a novel and I certainly, and yeah. I've done world building for uh, role playing games and stuff like that yeah. as well, but certainly not to that kind not of depth. Not to that level. Yeah. 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 And most of that has been set in the world that exists. Yeah. You're just building a story. out yeah, of Yeah. You're just, you're creating characters and interactions in a, in a local history, not the, yeah, you're not the broad history is already. Yeah, yeah, the broad <laughs> yeah. history has already been written. Um, so, but these, uh, like I said, I, Tolkien, I think is is one of the master storytellers, and um, I, I found his work fascinating, and I was really looking forward to Rings of Power, even after the Hobbit movies, which I guess I'll go ahead and comment on anyway, because I guess this is what we're doing here tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so. The Lord of the Rings movies were good. Yeah. Uh, particularly Fellowship, I thought, because part of it is that, um, first off, they they did a fair, um, a fairly faithful adaptation of Tolkien's work, and I, I know like people complained about things that were left out and so forth, but these are kind you of can't big, do it all. I mean, yeah. movies are gonna have to leave stuff out. Like. Absolutely. And when Fellowship came out the way they did uh, a lot of the um, even the CGI stuff which I mostly hate and th- the way they shot it and so forth it was just it was very it was new it was yeah. like when Matrix came out yeah you, you know Never. Matrix came out and you hadn't seen effects like that yeah really before and um, Fellowship did the same thing and it it made the the Twin Towers and Return of the King not f- not quite as good because it wasn't as it wasn't this it new wasn't thing. It wasn't novel, yeah. yeah. But, but they were still good films. Yeah. And then, um, and then they did The Hobbit, and they announced The Hobbit, and I was excited, and they said it's going to be a trilogy, and I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Sounds like, is there enough story there for that? <laughs> and it turns out, no. There's not, yeah. No, definitely not. It's the shortest of those books. Yeah. And they somehow stretched it out into, an, into a trilogy, and so... They created things that didn't happen in the books, and um, it lingers on these long, like like marching scenes. Practically, like they don't even use it for better character development or anything like that. And then it had these frenetic action scenes over and over and over and over again that seemed completely unreal, and it, they it wasn't good. Yeah, it just wasn't good. So I was hoping that I. Hope against hope, I guess. Yeah. That Rings of Power would be would be better, would be back to, you know, kind of really making use of the source material, telling a good story, and, and so forth. So is is Rings of Power based off of one of the books? Um, it's based off of uh, events in the Second Age that were expanded on in the Silmarillion. So okay. or and I guess other histories. I'm not sure what all Tolkien wrote, but it's yeah. it's set like a couple of thousand years. It's before the rings were forged. Okay. Uh, okay. And and that's actually what the story's supposed to be about is the forging of the rings. I got you. Okay. okay. So. And 
I, but I was excited. You know, it's an Amazon series. They spent like half a billion dollars to do the first season, which is like eight episodes. Yeah. Uh, that you could which, barely, that you could barely sit through, right? <laughs> Well, that turned out to be the problem. And so I left a two-star review. I was irritated enough by the time I finished it. And I watched yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, that I left a two-star review on Amazon. I figured I can't really give it a one-star because I, I did watch the whole thing. So it has to have been better than one star for me to yeah. have continued. Because I do have a three-episode rule. Yeah. That when I start watching something, I'll watch the first three episodes. If I'm still not liking it after the first three episodes enough, then I'll just quit. Absolutely. But I, you got to give it that opportunity. Because yeah. especially at the beginning of a story, sometimes characters are slow to develop. You don't really know anybody yet, and you're kind of confused about where it's, it's What's going. What's going on, yeah, yeah that so kind of thing. So y- you got to get past that, which uh, uh, there was somebody I knew who watched the first episode of Firefly and was like, this is boring. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get into this. I'm done. I was like, oh, dude, just... <laughs> you got to power watch, through, yeah, Watch it just a couple more episodes, and, yeah. and he ended up loving it. Absolutely. How could you not? Because <laughs> it's great. So I, I watched the first three episodes of Rings of Power. I was not enjoying it. Yeah. Um, but I kept watching it anyway. And so the fact that I made it to the end, cause I kept hoping that it would redeem itself. <laughs> Some point this is going to get better, right? Yeah. There, there's spoilers coming by the way. So if you, anyone yeah. out there who hasn't watched rings of power and wants to, <laughs> you might not want to listen. Uh, I, I hate to tell people that, but well, either way, uh, you're probably not going to enjoy it anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I'm, Spoiler alert. Anything there. like me. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you right from the beginning, if you're looking for a faithful to Tolkien adaptation, uh, this is not it. Yeah. But I wouldn't care about that, actually. I, like, I'm not so steeped in the mythology that I even remember all that stuff. I, yeah. You know, there's, they could have done a million things in that that had nothing to do with anything that Tolkien wrote. I yeah. wouldn't wouldn't have known any better. That wouldn't have been the complaint, it's, right? Yeah, it's been years ago that I read The Silmarillion. Yeah. Um, I haven't read any of the other histories stuff, so I don't know. Yeah. But that would have been fine if they had told a good story. Yeah. But they didn't. <laughs> In lies the problem. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do want to pick apart some particular aspects of it that I had a real issue with. And um, and I'll, you know, I'll tell you now, like what I wrote about it um, on Amazon was that the characters were flat and uninteresting, that the story was slow, um, mm. that it only progressed when it needed to. And it, they had to like contrive events to move the plot forward uh, that... Um, it it was so boring that it took me two or three sittings to watch each episode, and they're only an hour long. Oh wow! And uh, the you know there was some um, choreography that was that was cool, mm. some of the fight choreography and so forth that was cool, uh, but there was just as much that was just laughable, just silly, stupid, and yeah. um, that there were some like really beautiful landscapes that you kind of expect to see in Lord of the Rings stuff. Yeah. And they were there. There was some of that. Yeah. But since that's really the only part of the series that I took real joy in, that I feel like I would have been better off taking my time to uh, just a decent art museum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, at the end, I, I kind of summed it up. Well, oh, yeah. And the dialogue. The dialogue was so bad. The dialogue seemed very familiar yeah. because I listened to a lot of politicians. Oh, ah, okay. And that's why it seemed very familiar is because they kept talking. Like a politician? And they would talk and talk and talk. But when you really thought about what they said, they didn't say anything. They didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> or it was like, um, like a, a teenager trying to write something profound in their diary or something. I mean, that it was, it was yeah. really you know, on the surface level, like it sounded like they were saying something interesting, but then you thought about what they were saying. Like they didn't say anything at all. (laughs) Um, so there was a lot of that too. And then, uh, I I closed it by saying that it's probably a good thing. That's going to be a few years before the second season comes out to give the writers a chance to maybe reevaluate what they think they're doing and give us a chance to forget how disappointing this was. (laughs) So that's what I had to say about rings of power. So bear all that in mind when I go into the next part, Yeah, but Back to the, the, the <laughs> postulate here that the Me Too um, movement and, um, and modern feminism is the problem. Yeah. All of the main characters are women. Yeah. 
which I don't have a problem with. I like strong female characters in films. Like one of my favorite characters of all time is Sarah Connor. Yeah. Sarah Connor is a fantastic character. Yeah. Um, she, you know, she starts off like, and maybe I'll get more into this later, but she starts off as this kind of naive, um, you know, uh, like ignorant character that has no particular set of skills, but there's something about her that's special in her case. It's that she's going to give birth to the person who saves the world. Yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, at the beginning, somebody has to rescue her and get her along. Um, but by the, you know, by the second film, she's like prepared herself for this. And so she's trained and she's a, she's a badass. Yeah. Um, and, but the real, I think the real important part of her character, like the the real turn in her character, the part that makes her really interesting, is at the near the end of the second movie when she goes to kill the guy that's gonna create Skynet that ends up destroying humanity. Yeah. Um, she she can't. Yeah. Um, and she she like sees him as a father and as a human, and it brings out a humanity in her, and she thinks of her own. Um, her own motherhood and, and like, you know, it's this like really nice piece that she's not so cold and detached that she like comes back to her humanity and she can't bring herself to do this terrible thing to this person to prevent a more terrible thing. Yeah. And, uh, and they end up working together to try and stop it. Obviously they don't because there's like five more films. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most of which sucked. Yeah. Uh, but the first two films were really good. Yeah. And, um, and Sarah Connor was a really good, strong female lead. Yeah. Um, and she's a really fascinating character because she's like a full character. So it's like, she's got good aspects and bad aspects and, um, and internal conflict and, um, she fails at things and so forth. And that's what's missing now. Yeah. And that's, so the, the main character in rings of power is Galadriel. Um, <laughs> And like the real problem with her, besides that she shows the emotional, like the actress doesn't seem to be very good. Although I don't know that she had a whole lot to work with, but she shows the emotional range of like a peanut Yeah. in this, but she's completely overpowered. Yeah. Um, she, she doesn't ever, she doesn't display any real weakness except for idiocy, but that's not really her idiocy. It's idiocy of the story writing. No. Um, and she doesn't, like you need a motivation. She's got that, like, yeah. you know, and she's and and so like some of the aspects of the character building aren't bad. Um, so there's, she has faced adversity in that she's lost her brother and apparently her husband, although that's definitely non canonical, but yeah. um, anyway, she's lost her brother and her husband and this drives her uh, to try and destroy the evil um, Sauron. Yeah. And, um, but, like the adversity doesn't really play into her except that except for her single mindedness. Yeah. And it's like these terrible things have happened to her, but she's already overcome them. Yeah. Just like every other challenge she faces in the entire series. Like yeah. she never really loses. And so the problem is that she's the exact same character at the end of the season as she was at the beginning of the season. Like there's yeah. no character arc. There's no development because there's no room for growth because there's nothing wrong with her. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't fail. That So it presents no opportunity for her to, to learn and to overcome something within the story Yeah, that, that they're telling. Yeah. Like apparently she's overcome some adversity in her past, but we missed that. Yeah. So like the interesting part of her story is past and we don't get any of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they don't present anything interesting in this part of her story for her to overcome and grow and, and move as a character. Yeah. So she's boring. <laughs> now the second thing is like, and I, I'm, <laughs> I've seen this in a couple other places too, but I don't understand why, um, I guess Hollywood's idea of a strong female character is to display the traits of a male villain. Yeah. Because she's arrogant. She's rude. She lacks empathy and compassion. She, she uses everyone around her as a means to an end. She is completely self-centered. And I, I mean, I, I suppose it's supposed to show that she's, you know, ready to make the hard decisions and things like that. But what it actually makes is a character that you can't, you cannot possibly like. Yeah. 
Well, maybe they're going to flip the script, man. Maybe in the next season, they're, they're, you're going to find out that she's really the villain. <laughs> well, we can so, only hope. Yeah, because um, you think she'd make a pretty good one? <laughs> I think that she would. Yeah. Um, there's a scene like very early, like I think it's in the first episode, uh, where they're trudging through the snow on the way to some place for some reason. Yeah. Why? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but um, one of the guys in her group is uh, is flagging. Yeah. And, you know, they're fighting through this blizzard after climbing this mountain. And they're like, you know, please, let, let's just stop for a minute. And yeah. she's like, we can't. And she's like ready to just leave him to die there in the snow to go towards something that she doesn't even know <laughs> where exactly, like if it'll achieve anything. She can't yeah. stop for 10 minutes to help let this guy catch his breath in the meantime. I mean, yeah. it's it's such a it's such a terrible act. Yeah. I think. And like I said, I think it's supposed to show that she, you know, she's strong. That she's that a strong she's, woman. That yeah. Can, and that yeah. she's willing to make tough decisions to achieve her goals and so forth. Yeah. Um, but it really just makes her seem like a terrible person. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and for those who are listening to this and thinking, well, you wouldn't have a problem with that in the male character. Yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, one of the big things that, that happens a lot of times in male character arcs is that they do start off this way. Yeah. And then, and then they veer towards yeah, being and, a better person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then they, uh, you know, something happens along the way, some kind of loss. Yeah. Generally, yeah. um, that makes them reevaluate how they look at the people around them and show more compassion and empathy and be a better person. This never happens with her. Yeah. Yeah. At least not through the first eight <laughs> episodes. Right. right. Eight hours in, yeah. This hasn't changed. Like I say, I'm still hoping season two, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in 2025 or whenever it's supposed to come out. Yeah. Um, and so I, I started thinking, well, then the other film that I saw um, recently was uh, The Luckiest Girl Alive with okay. Mila Kunis. It's a Netflix original. Yeah. So now, I, so I'm attacking both Prime and Netflix here. <laughs> right, going, going after the big boys. <laughs> both yeah. the big boys. Um, And... Like, this is a story that did not go the way that I thought that it was going to go. Um, I, I thought it was a different kind of story. Uh, but it was kind of an interesting story. Um, but you have the same kind of same kind of thing where there's very little change in the character from the beginning to the end. Yeah. Like, she's more content at the end of the story than she is at the beginning. Like, she's m better adjusted, I guess, to her... The, like she definitely had some adversity in her past. I mean, the, yeah. she, you know, it's this woman that, that it depicts her overcoming, like the story is essentially of her overcoming, um, rape and sexual assault and being the survivor of a school shooting in, oh, wow. as a teenager. Yeah. Um, and, uh, like she's, she's self-reliant, which I appreciate. Yeah. Um, like this is something that I think is important for people to, to be able to, to be self-reliant. Um, but it's to a flaw in this case. So at the beginning of this film, she is engaged to a guy who, while not perfect, um, is somebody who clearly like truly cares for her and would do anything. almost anything for her. Probably. Yeah. I mean, like you'd certainly get that impression from this guy is that he, like if she asked him for anything, he would do his best to do whatever that was. Yeah. Um, and he gets frustrated with her because he doesn't understand why she kind of maintains some distance because she never tells him about this history, the at least stuff, not the, yeah. the rape and sexual assault. Like he knows about yeah. the school shooting, but yeah. anyway, um, but in the end she like overcomes all of this on her own. She, you know, writes a very public, um, article about it and it's well received and, um, she helps so many women who've had similar experiences and, uh, she breaks up with her fiance right before the wedding because she doesn't need him <laughs> and, um, and so forth. But it, it's another one of these issues where like, okay, there's, I have a couple of problems with this. First off, she's the same way as Galadriel in that all of these relationships that she has through the film they aren't real relationships. They're not like real social relationships. They're people that she's using to try and get somewhere. Yeah. Like everybody in her life is, uh, is a means to an end. Yeah. And this is not a heroic trait. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and in the end, you know, she, so she gets to this place where she's more comfortable and confident 
And so she sheds this guy. Yeah. And it, so it also reinforces this like um, lack of trust or lack of engagement with the people around you. Um, this kind of antisocial, not antisocial in the sense that I don't have any contact with anybody, but antisocial in the sense that I don't form any real relationships with the people around me. Yeah. Um, and uh, while at the end they say, you know, if you um, if you have been the victim of rape or sexual assault and you need help, you know, to contact this website. But they just had this movie where this girl kind of gets over it all on her own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, I, I don't think Did, that that's didn't realistic. Didn't use any of the resources that you would be getting if you called that number at the end of the show. Yeah. And didn't use her fiance who obviously cares about her. Not, not that yeah. he could have fixed things, but he could have, he and his family could have been a support group for her that she needed. Yeah. And, but it's depicted that she doesn't need them. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, like my experiences with people who yeah. have struggled with this, um, and you know, for my nearly a psychology minor that I got in, in college would suggest that this isn't something that people really get over on their own. Yeah. That these kind of experiences, these traumatic experiences, um, do undermine your faith in the people around you, yeah. uh, especially if it's childhood sexual abuse. Cause it's, you know, like from, a, um, a, a parent or family member or whatever, th this is like one of those experiences that completely undermines your trust because you, your trust has been broken by the people that you're supposed to like with unquestionably rely on them. Yeah. At that age where you're learning so much and absorbing so much. Yeah. Know. Um, and you know, there's a, a bunch of negative psychological side effects that are pretty common, um, mm -hmm. as a result of these experiences, um, <laughs> including like sociopathy, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, and narcissism and, and so, but trying to get through this on your own is ill-advised. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like I, I would suggest that if you do, if this is part of your history that you seek counseling that you try and use the people around you that that you can f be fairly confident care about you now yeah. as a support group. Um, and if not, to find a group that is like actually a support group, other victims, support groups, and things like that. Yeah. Um, but the idea that you can get over this on your own is silly. And so, but it also re reinforces this this idea that you can't trust other people and that you don't need them anyway. Yeah. Which is completely counter to like humanity's existence. Like we are social animals yeah. and, and having a social relationship doesn't mean like somebody that I talk to. And it definitely doesn't mean somebody that I use yeah. to get something else that I want. Yeah. Um, if people are just a means to an end, that's not a social relationship. Yeah. Um, a social relationship is, is an interaction, like a meaningful interaction between people, um, where there is kind of the, and I, I don't want to say interdependence because I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily the case, but, um, but, a, a, like a true friendship or, um, relationship where you feel like you can trust them, you can rely upon them, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. Like that's an important part of being human. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, so I, I didn't like this and, and, <laughs> and again, it's like reinforcing these negative traits about using people as a means to an end, which is a, one of the issues that I really have with it. And I was thinking about my friend, um, my friend from college, who was arguing with me about market versus government and capitalism versus socialism and so on and so forth. And, um, and I was saying that, that the important part of uh, the market is that it's a whole bunch of individuals. Uh, this is retreading old ground here, of course, but yeah. um, a whole bunch of individuals each making decisions that they think are the best decision for themselves, but it amalgamating in a way that creates a better whole for everybody. Yeah. And he was saying that he didn't like the idea of having a society built around individual desires that that was destined to fail and that you need a society built around, um, the common good. <laughs> yeah. But you're going to need like a whole like shift in humanity for that. Well, th that's also true. I mean, that's a, that's a, uh, an issue. People are generally self-interested. Yeah. And 
like you you can only ask what you can ask like yeah. <laughs> you know um but you know my of course the obvious question is well who decides what the common good is well there you go yeah um and we talked about this on the podcast a couple of weeks ago like that yeah that you and your wife have disagreements about what the common good is just for your family from time to time <laughs> right and like so how do you get an entire society to agree on what you need to all work together towards yeah um and what about the people that disagree and so on but what it does is it turns all all of the people into means to an end. Yeah. Yeah. That everybody, like it steals the humanity from everybody. Yeah. Um, Because even if you do it in a democratic way, then the, and the, the people that disagree, the minority, they're now just a means to the ends that the majority want. Yeah. Or if you have a group of wise elders that know, you know, what the best thing for everybody is somehow <laughs> yeah right <laughs> then everybody becomes a means to the to their ends yeah and so no matter what in a in a society where you have tried to decide tried to create a society built around everybody working towards common goals then you've created a society where everybody is means to an end yeah and you've stolen the individuality and humanity of all these people and you don't care about it and yeah. I, I find it ironic coming from a, a person who um, rails against uh, corporate um, life where all the employees are just a uh, cog in the wheel um, for the corporate profit or what have you, which makes them means to the end of the corporate goal. Yeah. What's the difference between whether it's a, a, a business imposing it or a government imposing it? Yeah. Still the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. And I, you know, I don't think I don't have any, I don't have any kids, but you've got two daughters. Are like, are these yeah. traits that you would want them picking up? Absolutely not. I mean, it's just that, yeah. Um, so I was thinking about some other uh, female characters recently, and so part of this, like feminism and Me Too. Here's where the Me Too thing comes in. Um, why is a Galadriel and Mila Kunis's character, whatever her name was, I don't remember. Um, and then, like another big example would be Ray from from the Star Wars sequel trilogy. Yeah. Like, why are they so overpowered, able to um, overcome everything on their own, essentially, and so forth? And it it's because in this climate, I guess now you can't tell a story where a woman fails. Yeah. And you certainly can't have her be defeated by a male. Right. <laughs> right. So you end up with this ridiculous That's... stuff with like Ray where, oh, and Gladriel too, where they, you know, they get in a fight with a cave troll or whatever. And her um, six male counterparts all working together get crushed by this troll and she jumps in and saves the day all by herself. Yeah. That checks out. By the way, she's like 5'2", and um, that w- armor weighs as much as she does, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, so it also creates a, a conflict. Where, like, you can only ignore so much to try and accept <laughs> whatever what the story is. But, yeah. Um, but then you have Ray, who, at the end of the first movie, uh, of the first of the trilogy, The Force Awakens, that was that one, I, I think? I think so, yeah. Um, the antagonist, she defeats yeah. And then in the second movie, The Last Jedi? I think so. <laughs> don't <laughs> I don't remember me. the names of these either. <laughs> um, she goes to uh, Luke Skywalker, who's one of the great heroes of cinema history. Yeah. Um, goes to Luke Skywalker for him to be her mentor. And she doesn't need him. Yeah. Like, he doesn't really teach her very much, and she defeats him in a fight also. Yeah. <laughs> so you have this character and she's got problems anyway because you know her motivation doesn't doesn't really fit with the story like characters have to have motivations in order for them to feel like real people yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know right. um and uh, i mean as far as i can tell um at least at the beginning of the story ray's motivation is to wait where she is for her parents to return yeah but then she doesn't really pursue that at all because if her goal is to stay where she is then why does she do any of the things that she does in the film because everything (laughs) that she does throughout the entire trilogy takes her farther and farther away from home yeah 
where she was trying to wait for her parents to return. So then like her motivation, as far as I can tell what it is, she yeah. doesn't follow it. So <laughs> it's not really a motivation. Yeah. So I guess it's either ill-defined or it doesn't really exist, yeah. um, which makes her, a, again, kind of a boring character, or at least a character that you can't understand. Yeah. And then she has no weaknesses. She doesn't fail. She doesn't grow. This, this is sounding yeah. familiar, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, there... So there's no real character arc. And so they're trying to like retell in a lot of ways, the original star Wars trilogy from the late seventies, early eighties. But that original trilogy was like a, like, I mean, it was a classic hero's journey story. Yeah. Where, Uh, Again, like Luke Skywalker is this farm boy disconnected from everything. He's naive. He doesn't know what's going on in the wider world. Um, But he has a special power that he doesn't even realize that 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 is driving him into a destiny where his life matters in some way. Um, And then he uh, he finds a mentor. The mentor helps to um, helps to helps him to adjust to this you know, this fate of his, um, to learn how to use the power that he has within him, um, and to try and steer him down a proper path. Yeah. Uh, but, um, he ends up, uh, jumping into things before he's really ready. And so he ends up in empire strikes back, um, thinking that he's ready to face Vader and failing miserably. Yeah. And losing his arm in the process and nearly losing all of his friends. Yeah. Um, and then he has to, he has to go and he has to recoup and figure out what to do next. And he has to learn and grow and become better. And then he comes back in the last movie and he's stronger and more focused and more disciplined, um, and, uh, and more cautious Yeah. and, uh, but still ambitious. Um, and he ends up being the great hero that not who does more than defeat his enemy. He actually turns his enemy to good back to the right side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's this like classic hero story. It's fantastic, really well put together story. Yeah. Um, it doesn't feel contrived, even though George Lucas is like not real good at dialogue and so forth. But I mean, like there's some yeah. things that you could pick at, but yeah. Um, but it's, it's a compelling story that people can relate to. And, uh, and Ray just doesn't have that. It's not a hero's journey because she never fails. Yeah. She never grows. She doesn't have to learn anything. She, she's she got all the skills that she needs to succeed from the very beginning, and none of that ever changes. Yeah. Uh, the original series definitely withstood the test of time. Yeah. Like, I mean, that that's the reason Disney spent all the money to buy the series. Yeah. <laughs> there was a reason because it, it, it worked. And then they succeeded in completely destroying it. I, I would say so, but I mean, because it like to go beyond that, if we're yeah. just going to start critiquing these films, um, yeah. they also destroy the character of Han Solo, who is another, yep. um, kind of anti-hero hero. Yeah. Uh, and they destroy the character of Luke Skywalker, who, when we do meet him in the second film is a bum who's complete, he's uninterested in anything. He's yeah. completely cut himself off. He doesn't want to help anybody. And that this yeah. is completely contrary to the character that developed in the original trilogy exactly. and Han Solo is the same way. They like yep. tear him down in the same way because yep. he went from being a, um, a, uh, selfish, self-centered, narcissistic criminal, yeah. um, to becoming a, a great rebel leader and general and was willing to sacrifice himself for others. And I mean, like, yeah, completely redeems his original character and becomes a, a powerful force for good instead of just this kind of sideline criminal. Yeah. Um, But when we meet him again in The Force Awakens, he's back to being a criminal. And now he's kind of like a bumbling idiot criminal, which at least in the first one, like he was always very savvy. He was sharp, yeah. Yeah. And so, and I actually heard uh, a guy on YouTube talking about it, and he was saying it's like the the problem, the, the reason that they keep tearing down these characters is because they don't have the creativity to create a character as compelling on their own. And yeah. so the only thing that they can do to make their character seem interesting is to rip down these old characters to the same mediocre level that they've managed to achieve, <laughs> yeah. um, which I thought uh, was funny and kind of insightful. There's something to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I, like, and I, I can imagine people out there saying, well, all right, so what about Anakin Skywalker from the, the prequel yeah. trilogy? Like he was overpowered. Yeah. 
right? Um, so why is he any different than, than Ray? Ray's overpowered, he's overpowered. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that his, um, his strength in the first film leads to some pretty severe character flaws. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So he's, he's so good at everything from the very beginning that he's impatient, impulsive, um, he bucks authority. He feels like everybody's holding them back. He becomes uh, jealous and envious of the people around him. Um, and he ends up like it ends up leading to his downfall. These character flaws that develop yeah. um, leads, because of leads his him to the dark side. See, but Ray is never, never experiences any of that. She's always like, she's actually the best person of these three girls that I'm talking about here. <laughs> yeah. Um, because she, she is empathetic. She cares yeah. about the people around her. She's, um, she's savvy and she's, uh, but she's never really tempted. Like, and so that creates a, a problem too, because one of the things about Luke and, and, um, and Anakin definitely is that there's the kind of this question. It's like the, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, what's his name in Rachel and friends? Uh, like oh. the will they won't they kind of thing, yeah. uh, you know, um, where it's there is temptation for them and and anger and, uh, you know, depression and this desire to to do more and to take the shortcut that yeah. has you kind of questioning at points whether they're going to stay on the good path or, or go to the dark side. You yeah. never have that question with Ray. Yeah. Ray's always under control, stoic empathetic like she's always good there's never a question about whether she'll switch to the dark side or not yeah um and but you obviously like you have that question with luke and you definitely have that question with anakin because he eventually does because he does yeah <laughs> because of these character flaws that develop as a result of him being so powerful yeah that ray never faces and um and like i said it leads to his downfall and uh, the loss of everything that he loves yeah Right. So that's a very different kind of character arc yeah. because there is a change from the guy at the beginning, the little kid, the bright eyed, you know, optimistic, hopeful kid yeah. um, into this brooding, angry, evil character at the end. Yeah. Uh, so th those are my <laughs> uh, those are my assessments of these things. And and so I but I think that a lot of it is about um you know, protecting female characters. Well, we're just, we live in a time where you can't write a female character. That's not going to be that strong, like just overpowering character. Like mm -hmm. that's just not the way things are written right now. Yeah. Um, so. Well, I mean, it's got to change because it doesn't, it doesn't create. And well, some of it too is like, you think about the Marvel movies um, which I lost interest in years ago, actually. Like, I couldn't keep yeah. track of the story anymore. And, you know, well, we're so in the was... multiverse now, so it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> well, that's a problem in and of itself. I could I could spend another half hour talking about that kind of thing, too. Yeah. Them erasing the past. Yeah. Which I've already talked about a little bit with the rewrites of Luke and Han Solo. Yeah. Um, in the Star Wars. And then uh, a friend of mine the other day was talking about uh, Star Trek and how they essentially, like went back and overwrote all the canon of the, of, you know, 40 years of Star Trek or whatever by yeah. putting them down a different timeline so they could do whatever they, they wanted. No, they the do characters. whatever they want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember um, that. I and, saw that one in the theater. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, and I heard about that with the Marvel stuff too. The, now yeah. it's the multiverse. So like yeah. contradictions don't matter. It's just a different timeline, yep. you know? Oh, it's lazy yeah. writing. It kind of is. <laughs> it's just lazy writing. And, um, but, uh, yeah, I think that the, like trying to protect the female characters is, is a big part of it. Cause you can't have them lose yeah. because then, you know, you're writing, um, well, I don't even, I don't even entirely understand the problem because they're not relatable characters and they don't help people, including women yeah. learn to face adversity and like, you know, real life. Yeah. <laughs> like things don't always go your way. Yeah. And I don't know how any of them can relate to them anyway, because nobody has gone through life where everything went their way. Well, I don't think it's not all coming up at Millhouse, you know? Yeah. I, I don't, I think that's kind of the point though, is that they're writing these characters, not really intending for them to be like 
um, relatable. Like they just that it, that's not really the point. The point is that they want you know this is this is the this is how we're going. This is the direction. You know, I don't know. It's weird. I don't understand what it's supposed to achieve. Yeah, and I, I think that they you know back to the CGI thing. I think that they they like pretty up this stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know the action is uh, constant. Yeah. to distract you you know they don't want to give you time to like stop and think for a second about <laughs> yeah. what's the story going that, on yeah. the story that's being told to you and whether this makes sense or not yeah um one of the other uh female characters in um the rings of power is uh this single mother um who's i don't remember she's like a bartender or an artist or a farmer so i can't remember what her actual job was no. Um, because, uh, as soon as things start to go bad, she is a, a, a military leader <laughs> Yeah, with, just somehow just steps into the role. Yeah. And, um, like, I don't, I don't have a problem with girl boss characters. It doesn't bother me. It's just gotta, it's gotta make sense though. Yeah. And, and this one doesn't. Well, and of course need... she's also like constantly abandoning her teenage son to go do these things for the, you know, for everybody else. And I'm like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't present a very good message either. I don't think, <laughs> right. let me say, and this will be probably unpopular for some reason that I cannot fathom. Yeah. Um, women out there, your superpower is motherhood. Yeah. Like that is all of your superpower. Yeah. And I, I don't think that you, uh, well, at least I don't think that the culture, the culture um, doesn't appreciate that. Now I think when you talk to women individually that they appreciate that. Yeah. But our culture definitely does not appreciate at least anymore. Yeah. I mean, there definitely was a time where it did, but we've, we've moved in another direction as a country and it's just, it, it's just that's the way it is. Like they, yeah. the cold. But that doesn't mean that the when you talk to your average person, I think they would absolutely agree with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that the part that I'm trying to get at is that for the women out there that um, feel weak or that they don't have the kind of influence in society that they feel like they should, the kind of influence that a man has, yeah. or what have you. I don't think that you really appreciate that the power that you wield by raising the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the kind of There's, influence that you have is yeah. completely outsized. Yeah. It, it, the, the women actually have far more influence on the direction of culture and society than men have. Yeah. Um, and it's for that reason, because you are yeah. the people that are mostly instilling the ideals into the next generation. Yeah. Every single generation. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and I think that, I think that's underappreciated by the culture too, yeah. but I think that that aspect of it is underappreciated by a lot of women. Yeah. yeah it could be. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. I yeah. mean, you can tell me I'm wrong. I, yeah. Like I said, I'm doing my best to offend everyone. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. So she like abandons these people and so, but you know, maybe her complete lack of any kind of military training that would justify her becoming a military leader is why they abandon their fortified position and go back to the open village that they started in to yeah. actually face off against the enemy. Yeah. Because <laughs> then, you know, then you have a really pretty fight scene to try and prevent you from stopping and thinking about that for a moment and saying, huh. That was a bad decision. That was a bad decision. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the most interesting of the, the female leads, I think is the, um, the Hobbit, the, uh, Femme Frodo, yeah. who at least has kind of a character arc. Yeah. Like a little bit, like she's, she overcomes her, her fear and, um, the tradition of her culture to actually like venture out. Yeah. That happens. <laughs> that that's like that's the that's, only that's something right yeah that's a change i mean at yeah. least that's it, she's the most interesting character for that reason yeah. because you see an internal struggle and in something that she she changes the way she's living her life yeah. at the end I, that's cool yeah. <laughs> i mean that could have been way better written too but <laughs> at least it's there but at least it's yeah at least there's yeah. something of a story all right uh it's it's definitely a, a sad time for movie and cinema right now. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, because, I mean, you just brought up a few examples, but there's plenty of them. Like, sto the stories just aren't as interesting and as good anymore. 
Well, and I, you know, I guess it's as an older person. Yeah. Now. As, as of yesterday. Of, of advanced age. Yeah. <laughs> advanced seems like a strong term, but um, as, as, an, as being older and wiser. Yeah. Um, I remember when there were good films. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, part of it may be, you know, back to a cultural thing, part of it may be that it's easy to kind of pull one over on, um, on a culture that has, uh, I don't know, um, a TikTok attention span. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to that too. <laughs> yeah. If you're, if the longest you pay attention to something is, is, you know, 20 minutes for like a YouTube video or, or something usually. Yeah. Then I'd say 20 minutes is a lot for some of these. Well, I, yeah, I agree. Um, the TikTok generation, it's like 90 seconds. Right? Yeah. Right. It's not long. Yeah. But if that's, um, if that's as long as they usually, are focused on anything, then it's easy to kind of push past these plot holes yeah, and be lazy in your writing. Yeah. And, and, you know, beyond just like these kind of weird cultural focuses on, on, on identity politics in film, yeah. um, you know, where the reason to go watch something is because it's such a diverse cast yeah, <laughs> or because, you know, they, they took the old male character and they replaced it with a female that does the same thing or the yeah. way that they're, they're kind of presenting these to you now anyway, instead of saying, Hey, we've got a really great compelling story yeah. um, that people can relate to, you know, about friendship and sacrifice and, and love and loss and things that all people can relate to. Yeah. Um, the, and maybe, you know, people out there answer me. I, I would really like to know, um, whatever ethnic background you are, can you only relate to characters that have the same ethnic background? Does the color of somebody's skin on the screen actually have that much of an impact on whether you relate to them or not? Now I know that there are like culturally relevant relations that can be made. Yeah. Like, you know, you probably, um, I don't know. I, I can't think of any specific examples really right now, but, uh, well, I mean, if you're talking about, um, you know, somebody that grew up on a reservation or something, they probably need to be American Indian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or indigenous probably. peoples or whatever we're calling them now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, the thing that draws people to them, like that, that allows people to relate to them, that's probably not it. Even if you are also a native American, yeah. like you can maybe relate specifically to that, particular life experience like specific life experience but the story that is gonna get you to relate to them that's not really what it it's actually about it's about these these shared things throughout humanity yeah the love and friendship and sacrifice and loss and yeah the things know. that kind of span over all of that or yeah. past all of that yeah um, and I, I don't feel like we're getting a lot of that and then uh, just another side note as long as I'm uh, critiquing the way stories are told now and the problem with not having much of an attention span. And I'm, I'm like, just like everybody else, when I watch a lot of films, I kind of want to just sit back and ignore the, the Politics stupidity of, of something. Well, no, not that oh, yeah. too, but yeah. although not as much, but yeah. no, I mean like the, the stupidity of some of the plot, Point sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and just like sit back and try and enjoy it on its own terms. Yeah, but I'm a big believer in that. But when it becomes so glaring and so obvious, there's only so much you can look past. Yeah, that's that's kind of my thing. And mm -hmm. and and I always go into stuff with kind of an an open mind and an assumption that you know this is going on in this world and this is kind of how these things are mm -hmm. but you do hit a point where it's like this is just absurd yeah and what you see a lot now is that um that something will happen that th th there's a complete lack of setup yeah in storytelling now so whenever the writer needs the plot to move along yeah. like some random character or event or whatever will push it along. Yeah. And it, it's not anything that has been set up and it doesn't feel natural or organic. It feels forced, forced. and contrived. Yeah. yeah. And that completely takes me out of, 
my yeah. just sit back and enjoy it on its own terms stuff because I'm like, well, that, that, where did this come from? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then you're sitting there thinking, well, where did it come from? Well, the script writer needed something to move the story along. And so <laughs> this is it. They couldn't yeah. come up with something beforehand and mm -hmm. like make it feel like part of the regular action. Yeah. They had to insert this thing to make it happen. Yeah. And it's jarring. Yeah. I always think, well, that was convenient. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's exactly, exactly it. Well, it sure is convenient that that guy was on the same plane. Yep, all right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so. Gosh, yeah. Um, like, uh, what was the um, what was the Dark Knight movie with uh, Blaine or Bla what was it? Bane? Bane. There you go. Yeah. I'm sure you know this one. Yeah. Big Batman <laughs> fan. Yeah. Um, but like uh, the plot to with the scientists at the very beginning of that film when they attack the plane, yeah. you you remember what I'm talking about the, when they're like transporting him or whatever, and yeah, um, and they attack the plane and like, which was a cool scene and it looks yeah. like it's done not with CGI. It looks like it was actually done with practical effects and it must have been super dangerous with real stuntmen and so forth, which yeah. is great. I love to see that now because you see so little. So of little. It. Yeah. I mean, look at the. Uh, behind the scenes stuff on a Marvel movie now. It's like it's, <laughs> it's the like, guy on the green screen. <laughs> it's like eight guys on a giant green studio stage. Yeah. Like everything is green except for the actors. Like yeah. the actors are there not interacting with anything, which maybe excuses the terrible acting. But yeah. um but anyway, that scene like, well, isn't it convenient that they brought this extra body along? And isn't it convenient that these two guys were on the same plane together? And isn't it convenient I, I, yeah. I don't know. It's like yeah. somebody could have worked a little <laughs> bit harder at that. Exactly. No, I agree. So that's uh, a, <laughs> that's an hour of me ranting about the state of, <laughs> of cinema. Yeah. Of cinema now. As and I, I'm not a great story writer because I'm not very good at dialogue, but I, I understand the structure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know what it should be. And I can definitely like look at somebody else's and, and, and um, be the, you know, backseat driver and, yeah. say well that just doesn't make any sense well there, i mean there is something to the stuff just isn't as good these days like there, mm -hmm. you can you can tell even if you're you don't know specifically like it's just if it's not good it's not good yeah. you know it just it feels forced i don't know all right and so i can i can wrap it up by bringing it back to politics and saying that the answer to this problem is the same as the answer to overbearing government yeah stop complying stop buying tickets yeah, right. <laughs> right? Like, don't encourage them with this terrible storytelling. Yeah. I mean, like, no matter how big a fan of Marvel you are and how you think the next one is going to be better than the last one, at least. Yeah. <laughs> give it up. Yeah, right. <laughs> give it up. Because as long as you keep buying tickets, they're going to keep lazily rehashing the same well, stuff. Well, that, and don't be afraid to write a review. And don't be afraid to write a review. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first yeah. time I've ever written, written a review. review. Yeah. I, I just, I couldn't let it go. Yeah, I get it. Can let it go, but I did start thinking afterwards, like I should do this more. <laughs> right, <laughs> there's it, more of this coming, guys. <laughs> it only took me ten minutes to write this review, and I, I think it's solid. I, it's yeah. only a couple of paragraphs, but I, you yeah. know, I said the right things. I like poked in the right areas, I think, and yeah. hopefully it's helpful to other people. And I should do more of this because there's like thousands of reviews on Rings of Power. I should yeah. write reviews on the films and stuff that I watched. That there's like. 20. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and tell you how great yeah. it was or how terrible it was. Absolutely. Or that it was mediocre, like yeah. Troll Hunter. Not the animated thing, which I did really enjoy. Oh, yeah. But the weird Swedish or Norwegian or something film, live action film. It was okay. Yeah. Wasn't great. Wasn't awful. Yeah. 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 No, no, not much of a story arc in that one either, but it was kind of a cool idea. Yeah. 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 There you go. So, yeah, two and a half and you round up. Hey, there you go. <laughs> All right. So, um, promise to be back to politics and current yeah. events soon. But, it, you know, I did feel like, I did feel like it was relevant. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I don't know. I've, I've kind of noticed this for a while. It's just kind of a shame. Like, I just hate to see. And I think it's a pendulum. Like, I think mm -hmm. it'll swing back the other way. It's going to take some time, though. Maybe by the time you get your next Lord of the Rings thing. <laughs> yeah, three years. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, the thing that bothers me about it is that it does concern me um, 
probably you more, even though we didn't, we didn't really talk about it a whole lot on this podcast. Cause then I, I just got off to ranting about how this is done, but, um, it does bother me a little bit how influential these things can be about people's behavior, especially young people. Yeah. And I, I don't, it well, worries me to think that, um, that men and women growing up, uh, think of some of these characters as heroes and these terrible traits of theirs as heroic traits. Cause they're not. That's why you need to have your kids watch the classics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These new movies are just not doing it, man. Yeah. Or at least pay a lot of attention to what they're watching. Yeah. Well, that too. Yeah. But this stuff's everywhere. I mean, there's, there's really no, the, the best way you can shield them from it is to, to raise them right. Mm -hmm. and, because that stuff is out there. They're going to see it. They're going to be like, it's just, there's no hiding them from it. You yeah. Know? So, and, yeah, you, we, and you wouldn't want to because then that then they'll just grow up unadjusted anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, there's enough trouble just from like this narcissistic push from uh, Instagram culture anyway. Yeah. That the that these characters that are so narcissistic being portrayed as heroes is yeah. just reinforces that already existing like cultural. Yeah. Um, I don't know more, I guess where everybody's seeking likes and attention and so forth. And I don't yeah. think that it's creating better people. No. Um, and, and the, I, I it concerns me just the a whole idea. I think probably the, the real message is to make sure that the, that your children and the people around you in general, um, don't use people as means to an end Yeah. that respect people as individuals and, um, and I, you know, I hope that we bring some of that, with the podcast. Absolutely. Try to. That, you know, that reducing down to the individual, the individual is the, each individual is the actor in, in society, in every aspect of society. Yeah. That none of us are means to an end to anybody else's. And you shouldn't be doing that to other people either. Don't yeah. think of people around you as means to an end. Respect them as individual people. Absolutely. There you go. That's a good yeah. message, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Good, good one to end on. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so we plan to be back in a week. Uh, and in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook, subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, and or Podbean. Uh, like and share. Um, leave reviews. You can always email me with uh, criticism or comments or suggestions or anything else at michael at the liberty dot com. And, um, yeah, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.